help them. Let's, let's turn with me, please, to Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8, we're again following the steps of Christ as we go through his public ministry. We looked at his messages for some period of time, and then we began to look at um, his methods, where, where he goes without preaching a message, what he's doing. And um, I'll be honest with you, I think this is the most unusual miracle in the Bible. I really do. I think it is. You'll have to, and you can see if you agree with me, uh, you may, may or may not. It's only found in, in verses 22, Mark chapter 8, verses 22 to 26. So what is that, five verses? And I have <clears throat> eight different questions, just boom, 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 as you're going through this. And um, I don't have answers to all of them, but and you may have more questions than I have. Okay, as you look into this. But this is a puzzling, it really is, in many ways a puzzling miracle. And yet God's obviously got some things for us. So what we're going to do, we're going to read the passage, we're going to have a word of prayer, and then I'm going to just lay out some of the questions and then we'll break down the passage, all right? So let's start by uh, reading it and then we'll pray. Mark chapter 8, starting with verse 22. And he cometh to Bethsaida, and they bring a blind man unto him and besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand... And let him out of the town. And when he had spit in, on his eyes and put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw aught. And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. After that, he put his hands again upon his eyes and made him look up. And he was restored and saw every man clearly. And he sent him away to his own house, saying, Neither go into the town nor tell it to any in the town. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this passage of scripture. Lord, uh, we know that you have a purpose in why this is here. And so we pray that you'd help us as we look at it to be able to get at the purpose that you have in this passage for us this morning. And we know there's more than what we can say and there's more than what I see. But we're grateful for what you have shown and we ask that your light would come upon us that your spirit would be our teacher, that you'd help us, uh, Lord, to uh, understand your word and to apply it, and we need your help to do this. So, Father, we give ourselves to thee. We thank you for this opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, questions. Let's see if, if you have some of the same ones I do. First is, uh, who are the people that brought the blind man? And there's not an answer. It just says... Um, he cometh to Bethsaida, and they bring a blind man unto him. And really, we don't get much more information. So I find that an interesting question to me. Who brought him? The second question I have is, why does Jesus lead him out of town? Because that's what he does. Why not just heal him where he's at? I think there is some light we can get on that, but I, uh, I think that's a question that needs to be considered. How about, why does Jesus spit in his eyes? That, that, a lot of people thought that, Steve. Literally, commentators are saying maybe to lubricate them. I mean, that's what they're saying. Why? I mean, don't cobras do that kind of thing? You know what I'm saying? Why spit in his eyes? Um, why does Jesus ask him if he saw anything? Why does he ask him that? Why doesn't he already know? What's that? Maybe, but but it's like why? Why does maybe he's asking? He's testing him, but why? Is, why does he say do that? It doesn't happen like that in the other miracles. How about this one? Why does the man, uh, what does the man mean when he says, I see men as trees walking? Good question by Judy. How does he know what trees look like? My opinion is that tells us the man could see it one time in his life. He wasn't born blind. Lost his sight. Why is the man not healed immediately? This is the only miracle that I know of well, I'll give you one other that just popped into my mind. When, when Jesus heals the ten lepers, as they run, they're healed. Okay? And, and then the, the one guy turns around, remember, he comes back to thank the Lord. So you could say that one wasn't like that. But this is kind of interesting, isn't it? I mean, the Lord says, do you see anything yet? And, well, I see. <laughs> it's, it's just interesting. Puts his hands on him again. So why does the man... Um, why does he touch the man again and make him look up? 
It's like, didn't we get it right the first time? It, I, again, I, I don't have all the answers to these questions, but this is a highly unusual miracle. And then why does Jesus tell the man not to go back into town? I think we might have some answers on that one. Okay. So let's, uh, you can see there's a lot, and, and, and maybe you have some other questions that came into your mind as you read this. This is a very unusual miracle. I think it's the most unusual miracle that Jesus performed as far as just things that you would not expect. All right, so let's now begin to just look at the passage itself. Let's talk about the blind man's helpers in verse 22. He cometh to Bethsaida, and they bring a blind man unto him and besought him to touch him. Now, I have about four things that we could say about the, the blind man's helpers. Um, what's the first thing you picked up on? What's the pronoun? They. What does that tell us? There's more than one of them. That's it. There's more than one of them. Okay? Um, but who are they? Are they friends? Are they relatives? Are they maybe some people in the town that just know what Jesus can do and they're running around and saying, they find a guy and, hey, why don't you come to Jesus of Nazareth? He'll heal you. We don't know. We don't know who they are. Um, so uh, we don't know, but we do know that it seems to be more than one of them. Um, what else do you know about these guys? Or women? Oh, okay, Sandy's saying they probably are believers because they... They had faith that Christ could help this guy. That's why they're bringing him. By the way, we don't know about the level of faith of the blind man. We don't know if he went willingly. He certainly went. If he went very skeptically, we don't know. But he went. It's interesting. So we, what we don't know about the... Um, uh, we know that the, these guys had some faith. Okay, now let me also point out a word in verse 22 where it says they besought him. Which means that word um, if, uh, means to beg. Maybe some of you have that word, to beg or, or, or plead or entreat. Okay, so what would we also be able to say about them if they're begging Jesus to touch him? Yeah, they've got zeal. Very good, very good. They've got great zeal in asking Christ to help. And then they, what, they're asking him to do something specific. What are they asking Jesus to do? To touch him. So they have... A suggestion as to how the Lord should heal him. And if you think about it, when we pray, often we're like that. We have a suggestion as to how God should do what we want him to do. What's that? I think that is highly likely, Sandy. What Sandy is saying, if you didn't hear her, was that they probably saw Jesus touch other people and heal them. No, no, I don't think spitting in your eye would be my first option either. Matter of fact, if you were, if you were the blind man, okay, and you were told up front that Jesus is going to spit in your eyes, I don't know. So let's talk about the different tactic that the Lord used. What was that, Steve? They might have had to drag him. You're right. They knew that if he knew what was going to happen. So Jesus gives some different tactics here, and they start at verse 23. Notice the first one. He took the blind man by the hand. Okay? So let's think about taking him uh, away from the crowd because it says that he took him by the hand and led him out of the town. Now, um, he's... He, this idea of leading him away from the crowd and, and taking him by the hand, when you think of, of someone taking you by the hand, what do you think of at that point? I'm sorry? Yes, there is something. Per That's a pretty neat picture, by the way. That's over in Afghanistan in 2007. There's one of our servicemen... And if you'll notice, he's got a little Afghani boy, and he's got his hand. And what does that picture, what does that picture speak to you about? Okay, there is definitely an element of trust there. What else are you seeing? Good. Yeah, Pat. Compassion. Tenderness. Here's all the verses 
that talk about, now, if you look up, as I did a search, there's like 111 different verses in the Bible about uh, by the hand of, okay? But most of those are dealing with, like, um, saying that uh, the, the nation won the victory by the hand of the president or something like that, okay? These verses that I've listed for you are the ones that I found that specifically are talking about taking someone by the hand, okay? And I'm just going to show you the ones in blue because they're in the same gospel that we're at. So let's go to chapter 1 of Mark and look at verse 31, and you'll find a case where someone takes someone by the hand. Back up in verse 30, you'll get the picture. Simon's, that's, that's Peter's, wife's mother lay sick of a fever and anon, or immediately they tell him of her. So Simon Peter gets back to the house and his, his mother-in-law is sick of a fever. Notice verse 31, uh, and he came and took her by the hand, that's Jesus, and lifted her up and immediately her fever left her and she ministered unto them. Now, he could have touched her on the forehead. He could have done something different. He takes her by the hand. Okay? Uh, go to chapter 5. Chapter 5. And this is, the, um, this is the, uh, Jairus' daughter when she, when she died, remember? Okay, I'm going to pick up at verse um, 40. And they laughed him to scorn, but when they put all out, he taketh the father and mother of the damsel, the girl that had died, and them that were with him, and entered the house where the damsel was lying, and he took the damsel by the hand, and said unto her, Talitha kume, which is being interpreted, damsel, I say unto thee, arise, and uh, he restored her to life by taking her by the hand. Um, chapter 8, verse 23 is the one we're on, so go to chapter 9 and verse 27 just beyond it. And this is the last time Mark will refer to it. And um, this is a boy who was demon-possessed. And so I'm going to back up so you can see this, okay? Um, at verse 26, Jesus has just uh, commanded him to come out of, of the boy, the demon, to come out of this child. And the spirit cried, that's the demon, and rent him sore or tore the, the child, okay? And came out of him in so much... Uh, um, as one dead, insomuch that many said he is dead. So the boy's laying there like, looks like he's lifeless. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. So just in those references, by the way, the Judges 16 reference is when Samson was blind, and he asked, a, remember they had a boy that took him by the hand, and he said, bring me over to the pillars where this house stands, so he was going to knock them down. Okay, that's the judge's passage. And in every one of those cases, okay, I think what you're going to find is helping somebody in need, okay, and the issue of tenderness. And so uh, it's interesting, when you think of the Lord taking you by the hand, um, he really wants to help you, and he's ministering to you in a very personal way and expecting you to trust him. All right, so that's a different tactic than the guys were expecting. Maybe, well, there's a touch there, but they, I think they were expecting something a little bit different. But then let's talk about him spitting in the man's face uh, because that's pretty much, I mean, spits in his eyes, but that's the same idea. Look, if you would, again, in verse 23 of, of Mark 8, it says, and he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town when he had spat or spit in his eyes. Okay. So he spit in his face. Now, when you think of having someone spit in your face, what do you think about? Repulsive. Insult. Here's the uh, um, cases of spitting in your face. In Numbers chapter 12, verse 14. God was talking about Miriam when she had complained against Moses, she and her brother Aaron, and he gave um, her leprosy in a short term. And what Moses was begging God, he said, please don't let her die of leprosy. Don't, don't let her have this just for criticizing me. And God said, if, if her father had spit in her face, she would have been 
uh, commanded to be outside the camp for seven days. Okay, if, if, if you've caused that kind of disgust, that was the rule of Israel at that time. That if, you, if you caused that kind of disgust between you and your father, where he spit in your face, that was a high offense. That sh showed that you had done something very evil. And so God kept Miriam out of the camp for seven days. Deuteronomy chapter 25 and verse 9. You can turn there if you want to. And you'll find another case where the Bible references this kind of a thing. I'll go ahead and read it. He says, then shall his brother's wife come. This is in a situation, are you familiar with leveret marriage, where if a brother dies and his wife has no children, then um, the man's brother would, would marry his wife, and that first child would carry on his, his uh, dead brother's inheritance. Okay, so if a guy's not willing to do that, okay, he's not willing to help his brother out and raise up a child on behalf of his dead brother, then here's what they would do. Verse, chapter 25, verse 9. Then shall his brother's wife, the woman that he was not willing to marry, come unto him in the presence of the, of, of the elders, shall loose his shoe from off his foot, shall spit in his face, and shall answer and say, Thus shall it be done unto the man that will not build up his brother's house. It was again an insult. Job chapter 30 and verse 10. Job talked about a people around him after God had, had judged him greatly how they were spitting on him. In Matthew chapter 26, are you familiar with this? It's, it's when Jesus was, uh, was condemned by the, uh, by his, uh, uh, at his Jewish trial for blasphemy. Verse 66 and 67 says, they said, what do you think? They, they answered and said, he is guilty of death. Then they spit in his face and buffeted him and others smote him with the palms of their hands. So one of the ways they were showing contempt for Christ under, under the, uh, uh, the charge of blasphemy was to spit in his face. So I find it very interesting that Jesus would do that. Yeah, what do you think, Frank? Right. It's interesting. What, what, um, what Frank is saying is that Jesus has spit on other occasions to do something. By the way, he spit to make clay for the blind man in, Mark, in John chapter 9. And you're referencing, in, in, what is it, Mark 7? 31? Right, where he, 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 he spit and he put his, his, uh, he spit, uh, on, his, uh, on his tongue, didn't he, or something along that line? Far away from the multitude. So Frank is wondering if it's, it's because he's thinking it might be offensive to the people around him. Maybe they take it the wrong way. And that certainly is a possibility. You can see why there's a lot of questions on this, on this, on this particular um, incident. But we, what we'd have to say is that typically in our culture, in their culture, you spit in somebody's face, that was an affront. I'm not going to go there yet. We'll talk about it. Then he puts his hands on the man. So he did do that. Now, again, back in verse 23 of Mark 8, he took the blind man by the hand, led him out of the town, and when he spit in on his eyes and put his hands upon him. Okay, so Jesus does that. He does put his hands upon the man, and then he asked the man if he saw anything. At the end of the verse, he, and, and put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw aught. And, and you're wondering again, well, Lord, you, why don't you know that? And we've talked different times that the Lord does not always use as, as omniscience. Also, again, maybe he's getting the man to think about what's going on. But then we have to say he performed a partial hear, healing. Because look at verse 24. And he, um, uh, I'm sorry, we're still in verse 20, uh, yeah, 24. And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. What does that mean? And I have puzzled over that over the years. I... See men as trees walking. Uh, I listened to actually two and a half messages on that very topic this week, trying to get some insight. And quite, quite honestly, it wasn't that helpful. Um, did that, Matt? Yeah. Right. 
Okay, so man's kind of drawing the analogy between a tree and its fruits and how Jesus looks that way. That's possible, but the man is saying, I see. I see men as trees walking. Yeah, Tony. Yeah, I think, I think you're, you're kind of getting at it. He doesn't have good focus. So basically, <laughs> it looked like here's a stump of a tree or here's a human. The only way he can tell them the difference is if the human moves. He can't, he can't, he can't distinguish. So he's got partial hearing, healing. He's, he's able to see something, but he's not seeing the whole thing. Isn't that interesting? That he only healed in part, at this point, only partial healing. It's just interesting. Different tactic. And then after partial healing, Christ completely heals him. Verse 25. And after that, he put his hands upon his eyes, made him look up, and he was restored and saw every man clearly. Whew. And then we have this unusual command. And what's the command? What's that? He sent him directly home. He says to him, he says to him, um, uh, I'll read the verse. I'll, I'll bring up what I'm thinking about it. He sent him away into the house saying, neither go into the town nor tell it to any in the town. Some of your other uh, translations have a shorter rendering of that. It's basically don't go back into the town. Now, when I, when I uh, looked at this passage of scripture, one of the things that I, I like to do um, that it's not unique with me by any stretch. I uh, got it from somebody else. But you, 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 um, you look at something that's repeated in a passage. You look for things that are mentioned over and over again. And it's kind of interesting. If you think about the town itself, okay, you're given the exact name Bethsaida. Okay. By the way, the town Bethsaida means house of fish. It seems to be in an area, they're not exactly sure where it's at, but it seems to be an area that was, that was great for fishing. Now, you need to hold that thought because of some people that enter into there. But the town Bethsaida is mentioned in verse 22 specifically. Um, uh, then I want you to notice, uh, let's see, in verse 23, he leads them out of the town. See that there? Um, let's see. And then in verse uh, 26, he says... Um, Neither go into the town nor tell any in the town. That's, that's how the, the, the longer reading is. So you have four different mes mentions of the town in that passage. To me, that says there's something significant about Bethsaida and what's going on here. So let me try to outline a little bit what I'm, I'm thinking. First of all, is that Bethsaida was a town with unique blessings. Go to John chapter 1. Okay, John chapter 1. And... Um, you want to look at verse 44. John chapter 1 and verse 44. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, it's the same town, the city of Andrew and Peter. Okay, so what did we just learn about Bethsaida? At least three of the disciples came from that town. At least three. And they're pretty prominent ones. Andrew, Philip, Peter. By the way, James and John might have also come from the same town. Because they were friends and they were fishermen. And Bethsaida was a great place for fish. Now, a lot of people have assumed that Peter lived in Capernaum because after Jesus performed a miracle in Capernaum, after, excuse me, preached in the synagogue of Capernaum, he goes back to his, to his house and his mother-in-law had the fever. But it's very possible that Bethsaida and Capernaum were close enough that that was, a, that was not a very difficult walk. And so uh, it, is, it is, you know, I guess scholars would probably be mixed on it, but Peter at least comes from Bethsaida, Philip comes from Bethsaida, Andrew comes from Bethsaida, possibly James and John as well. The people of Bethsaida had some of their best sons as Jesus' disciples, is the point. They saw what Jesus was doing with these men. But I want you to look at another passage with me. And that is Matthew chapter 11, and look with me at verse 21 and 22. 
Matthew 11. This is not the only place it's recorded. It's recorded in the Gospel of Luke as well. But from this passage, we learn that Bethsaida was a place that had rejected great light. If you back up to verse 20, you get the context here. He says, Then he began to abrade cities wherein most of his mighty works were done because they repented not. Woe unto thee, Chorazin. Woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. These were Gentile cities that were destroyed. He's saying these cities would have been spared. They would have repented if they saw what you saw. Verse 22, but I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And by the way, the next city he condemns is Capernaum, which is evidently right close to Bethsaida, which also saw great miracles. So that leads me to the question, why does Jesus tell them not to go back into that town? They probably wouldn't believe it anyway. Not that, not that they wouldn't understand the miracle that took place, but they weren't going to accept him as their Messiah. So let's go to some conclusions from this. Number one, God does not always want you to give credit uh, for helping other people. We don't know who those people were that brought the blind man. We really don't. All we know is that they were, um, they were helpful. Oh, by the way, let me go back through my questions real quick before I go on any farther with the conclusion. Number one, uh, who are the people that brought the blind man? We don't know. And the reason why we don't know is because God doesn't want us to know. <laughs> and so there are times where, that's why I conclude that, that, that um, really it's not about you getting credit. It's a privilege to help people. And we need to keep that in mind. It is always a privilege to help and we don't need the credit. Sometimes people say, well, so-and-so never said thank you. Okay. That's not hopefully why you did it. And I get the fact of trying to help people to receive that responsibility and the need to be thankful. I get that. But the bottom line is simply this. That's not why you help people. And God determines, for whatever his eternal purposes are, the people that brought the blind man to Jesus and had enough faith and begged the Lord to help him, those people are go, go unnamed. And that should be okay with us too. How about this second question that we had at the beginning? Why does Jesus uh, lead him out of the town? Well, it's pretty obvious that he does not want the town people to see this miracle. Question number three, why does he spit in his eyes? I can't tell you that. But I can tell you this. That sometimes... We need to be humbled before we can be helped. There are times when what looks like God giving me a slap in the face is exactly what I need to be healed. There are times when I need to be humiliated in order that I might look up and see my need for the Lord. And so, no, this is not something that you would think socially acceptable for the most part. But Jesus has a purpose in why he's doing it. And I can't give you all the purpose, but I do think this. I think that many times in life, God puts us in situations that humble us in order that we might turn and, and our lives truly change. How about this question? Why did Jesus ask him if he saw anything? Well, here's my best. And that is Christ is not expecting this man is fully healed yet. There's times when God is working in your life or my life and, and the work isn't done. Right? We still got a long way to go. So what did the guy mean when he says that men, uh, sees men as trees walking? He means that he can't, he's not fully healed yet. He, he can't focus. His eyes aren't quite working right yet. And then we have to ask, well, why wasn't he healed immediately? And again, I don't know. I can tell you this. God works with us uniquely. How he works in your life isn't the same as how he works in my life. There's a lot of similarities, but it's not the same. 
It's just like every fingerprint is different. Every relationship with God is different. There are commonalities, absolutely. There is, there is only one God. There is, there, is, there is a personal relationship with God through his Holy Spirit that comes into our lives. There are certain commonalities, but there is a uniqueness to each relationship. How about this question? Why does Jesus touch the man again and make him look up? And again, I don't have the answer for that one either. I, I can say that this illustrates the truth that we need sometimes an extra touch from the Lord in order to get in order to get a proper focus in life. Sometimes, sometimes we need another touch, and I think we need one every day, to be honest with you, to get a proper focus in life. Why does Jesus tell the man not to go to back to Bethsaida? I think what from the verses we've looked at, that this town had hardened their hearts, and more light would only make them harder, and more responsible for their rejection of the Lord. This means Christ's refusal to give them more evidence of his lordship through this miracle was both a judgment upon them for their rebellion and an act of mercy at the same time. A judgment because he was done showing them. An act of mercy because at least they would be less responsible than they would have been if they'd seen another miracle. Um, we had a message a few weeks ago on when Christ walks away, and sometimes the Lord does for that very reason. Let's go on in our conclusions. We have to conclude that God often does not do what you expect in the way you expect. The, the, the guys that brought the blind man, they, they just lay your hands on him, Lord, and everything will be fine, and Jesus goes a completely different direction. So God often does not do what you expect in the way you expect. I find this interesting, too. Times of loneliness and humiliation are often Jesus' tender leading. Now, I want you to think about this. He leads him by the hand, away from the people, spits in his eyes. And there's a picture of being out there by yourself, lonely, and yet who's got your hand? Who is being tender in your life? Who is showing his guidance, his leadership? Are you willing to follow and take his hand and say, yes, Lord? Like that little kid with the soldier. He's, he's, he's got his little hand in that soldier's, in that soldier's hand. You, the soldier's not grabbing that kid. He's not forcing him to. He's offering a hand. There are times when, when loneliness and, and humiliation seem to be all around you, and you think, where, where is God in all this? Well, actually, he may be actually holding your hand in a more tender way than you realize. In Hosea, I think it's chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. I looked it up yesterday. Let's see if I'm right on that. You can, you can check me out if you want to. Hosea 2, 14 and 15. And in this particular passage, Hosea um, has a, um, a wife that has been disloyal to him. And here's what God, and God uses it as a picture of his people's disloyalty, our disloyalty to God spiritually. And here's what God says about what he does for his children that are disloyal. He says, therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness. When you think of wilderness, what do you think of? Desolation, loneliness. I will allure her, bring her into the wilderness, and speak comfortably unto her. Again, you have the idea of taking her by the hand. I will give her the vineyards from thence, the valley of Acre for a door of hope. Now, the word Acre there, A-C-H-O-R, it means weeping, or tr I'm sorry, it means trouble. I'm going to give her the valley of trouble as a door of hope. God says, sometimes I bring trouble into your life as a way of giving you hope. She shall sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. Often God does take us by the hand and lead us out away from the others into a place of desolation, of even humiliation. But it is a place that we need to go if we're going to be healed. Number four, 
There is a limit to the light God may give you. And I take this as a warning to those of you who may be listening and, and yet not responding to the Lord because what Jesus is doing here, the city of Bethsaida had seen enough. They'd seen, they'd seen changed lives of their own sons. They'd seen miracles performed at the hands of Jesus of Nazareth. They'd seen what he could do. They'd seen lives that he changed. And it came to the place where it's like, that's enough. You won't believe. You won't believe. So by, by way of application, I want you to see God's goodness to take you by the hand, even in loneliness or in humiliation, but also fear God's wrath if you reject the gracious offer of his salvation. In closing, I'm going to read one verse. It's in Romans chapter 11 if you want to go there. It's uh, verse 22. And it really gives the, I think, what you see in this account. You see both the goodness and the severity of God. You see the goodness of God in taking a blind man by the hand and taking him out. And even though he had to go through some, some uh, difficult situations here with having his, spitting in his eyes and not having everything come into focus yet, he was given his healing. But you see the severity in the fact of Jesus taking the man out of Bethsaida and saying, don't go back there. Don't tell anybody from there. Just accept the miracle and go to your home. Romans chapter 11, look at verse 22. Apostle Paul talking about, about um, grafting the Gentiles into the family of God. It says, behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God. And they're both there, folks, in the nature and, and the attributes of God. The goodness and severity of God. On them which fell, severity. And the severity that, that ultimately comes from rejecting the Lord is hell itself. Eternal. On them which fell, severity. But toward thee, goodness, if thou continue in his goodness. Otherwise thou also shall be cut off. And we're even in that situation, even as a people today. We've been blessed with much goodness of God in this land. We have. We've had much. But we may face the severity too. We continue to reject the Lord. But, but nations are made up of individuals. What will you do? Will you accept the goodness of God? Will you let him take your hand? Will you, even if it means humiliation and loneliness, will you let him heal you? Will you trust him? Or will you reject him? There, really, you see the two different sides in this brief account. And let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the beautiful picture of our Lord taking this blind man by the hand. One man, one individual, uniquely ministering to him, healing him, changing his life. Lord, we see the, the townspeople. Yes, there's believers in there, Peter being one of them, Andrew, Philip. Maybe James and John, same town, maybe. They were changed. But tragically, many, many households who took all the evidence, who took all of what you were doing and all that you were showing them and threw it away. Oh, Lord, we know that your goodness and your severity are taught in the Scripture. I pray for those who are under your judgment right now, that they might turn and find your goodness. I pray, Lord, your mercy upon those that deserve severity. And we just thank you for this account, as confusing as it often is. We thank you for the lessons that we can grab from it as we watch our Savior in this unique account of healing a blind man. Open the eyes, Lord of people today, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. With our heads bowed for just a moment. Maybe you're a Christian, and to be honest with you, you've kind of lost focus. You're like that